Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome back to Open UN Engagement in the Age of Real Time. Uh, we're here now to participate in a uh, panel discussion about real time operations. Um, here to moderate this discussion and the one uh, following it about real time institutions, I'm very honored and um, grateful to David Brancaccio. Uh, David is a special correspondent for the Economy 4.0 series on public radio's marketplace. And he's going to be our moderator and facilitator for the discussion. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I normally absorb a lot of my cutting edge knowledge from some of the journalism we do, but probably the greatest source of what's happening out there is my son, who's a senior at the Rhode Island School of Design. So I was a little disturbed the other day when he called to say, or texted to say, that a, uh, one of his professors had come in looking very agitated. And when the class said, what's the matter? He said, I think it's finally happened. What is that? I think Google has become self-aware. <laughs> so I thought, ha, 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 I had the same reaction. Try it at home. Type in Google S-E, and it goes self-aware right away. <laughs> and it's possible, right? I mean, HAL 9000 computer in 2001, if you listen to the movie, HAL was born in 1992. If you read the Arthur C. Clarke, it's 1997. They changed the date. But, um, you know, Google's older. And if, by the way, if you t type into Google um, HAL9000S, it goes self-aware. And then if you type uh, Google HAL9000B, uh, it knows that you want to know its birthday instantly. Just saying. Um, this panel reminds me a little bit, the timing of it, with a um, session I did many years ago uh, <coughs> down in New Orleans, I was supposed to get up at a podium at the very moment that the O.J. Simpson verdict was being announced. So I didn't try to compete. We just threw a TV up there on the podium, and we waited. Given the events in Egypt, <laughs> we're competing with some big news events. My initial thought was I could keep my iPad on and watch it for you, but that will be the old paradigm, top down. Let's crowdsource that information. If during the course of events this afternoon, no matter what we're talking about, if one of you does this, this symbol, time out, that means you've gotten a flash on one of your electronic devices that there's been a change at the top of Egypt. So uh, well, I'm relying on you, all right? The Wi-Fi is working, I trust. <laughs> it's, I, it's, I, I was going to say, Alhamdulillah might be a better response. Right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, it is a great delight for me to be here with you. Our first panel today has been put together by the UN and Global Pulse at Social Media Week. To, we're going to do a little exploration here. How open, social, and real-time technologies are changing, among other things, relief and development operations around the world and creating new opportunities and challenges for teams on the ground and in the field, supporting new kinds and new forms of collaboration and, and community engagement. In response to events, I mean, like what we're seeing in Egypt, or of course the earthquake in Haiti, and the effort to manage the aftermath, we're beginning to see new forms of, of efforts on the ground that include citizens on the ground and volunteers around the world. I'm joined today by an amazing panel. Both panels today are just intergalactic class. You have the blue pamphlet, you'll see. I mean, it's uh, the reflected glow of the eminence of this panel is enough that you need some sort of sunscreen. Uh, I'll keep the introductions extremely brief uh, here because you can read in full detail in the blue sheet. But um, just a, a quick whip round here. Um, Corinne Woods. And we have Jihad Abdallah. Thank you very much. From Emergency Officer and GIS Focal Point, Office of Emergency Programs at UNICEF. Corinne, I didn't say your title. I need to at least say the title. Director of the UN Millennium Campaign, no less. Um, we also uh, have Sean Gourley, researcher and CTO at QUID, but a lot of other cool stuff involving decathlon, et cetera. <laughs> so uh, check that out. Um, Katrin, with a name like Brancaccio, I always want to hear. Katrine. Is, is it Katrine? And then say, say your last Verklaas. name as well. Verklaas. 
So Katrine Verklaas, co-founder and editor of mobileactive.org, and Nigel Snowd, Senior Information Management Officer of the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Efforts. Thank you very much for being here. We're going to start by going just through the panel, and then we'll get a discussion going, um, cross-pollinate some of these ideas, and we will, of course, be taking some questions from you and remotely via Twitter, and people are going to bring up the harvested crop of questions on card. We'll pose them to the panel. And we'll get through as many as we can. We have about 15 or 20 minutes for that at the end of this particular panel. If you're sticking around for the second panel, there's even more Q&A time. And if there's some remaining questions, we could throw them in there. But um, to my left, to your right, uh, Corinne, I just want to, uh, actually, you know what? I was going to come to you numero due. Let's go over to. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, poor, poor Jihad Abdallah, I, I told yeah. him he's going to be first, that he kind of wishes that weren't the case. It's always unenviable. Just give me a sense, uh, Jihad, from what you have seen on the ground, first person in your work, how are new technologies, real-time stuff, open engagement of the crowd, however you want to define it more specifically, how's it changing what you do in the field? Mm. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's just a great event. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the most unique things about what happened in the last maybe 15 days in the Middle East is just the fact, especially Egypt, is the fact that a Facebook, Twitter, all these social networks became the, the norm as a communication tool. There's no CNN anymore. There's no Fox News anymore. There's no BBC anymore. It just, it's Facebook, it's a Twitter, it is really, um, small network that people created on the ground. If, you're, if you go back to, to what happened in Egypt 15 days ago, there was a call for day of rage in Egypt. And people signed on Facebook. 80,000 people signed. That's no guarantee that 80,000 will be in Tahrir Square that day. However, 30,000 made it. That's, say, this is the largest crowd in Egypt since the Independence Day which is a long, long time ago. These people on the ground, they're not just on the ground, they are wired. They have their SMS messaging going on. They have their Facebook updated on the ground. They have YouTube picture on the ground. So CNN actually and those major news agencies are tapping to those people, getting the news from them. They're not even tapping to their own reporter because their own reporter getting beaten up by the government and the government people. So however, you see these things going on some, you know, like flash point, one point by one point, second by second. You open the page of Twitter and you put dash Egypt, you get every single thing going on in the Tahrir Square, which is the main, you know, the main revolution point. It's live. And it's fascinating because for me as an operation officer at UNICEF, I rely on the news coming from wire services. And I, you know what I did? I just, I just opened my Twitter account and I put Twitter in the, in the screen. I have a large 56 inches and I have half of Yunus downstairs looking at Twitter <laughs> and monitoring things going on exactly one by one. What's happening? What's this person? We need water. We run out of medicine. We get beat up. And don't go to that direction because there's, you know, under, you know, pro government people are waiting for you. Move to the second section. Do not take this road. It's fascinating. It's life. You know, it never happened. When revolution in Iran took a place, the only few images you get still images. You never see a real life images until they were released by the government. So this is a new age, and it's a great opportunity for us as humanitarian actors in the ground to tap in that and to engage as fully as we could. So I Jihad, does the new technology, the new new technology, people carrying mobile devices and so forth, does that fact allow you to do what you do with a greater level of specificity or granularity? Because, I mean, we've had the TV <coughs> feeds for a good while. I mean, that That's was correct. revolutionary, pretty much live. <clears throat> but, uh, but we have even more than that now. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the, the last news came yesterday that we, we shipped 99 million computers this year. However, we shipped 101 iPhone. That's tell you something. Usually the, the, traditional, the traditional device is computer, where you get to the web and you do your things. iPhones became more. Because people understand that when I can walk in the street, I can Twitter, I can send a text message, I can go on my Facebook and write a message and distribute it to all my audiences, all my networks, in a you know, matter of five seconds. I don't have to go to log in my computer, I don't have to sit and hide somewhere to do it. I can do it on the street. That's mobility is critical. 
for, for anything, for even for humanitarian actors on the ground. You shaheed a great example during Haiti that you shaheed the messages came out, SMS messages, tell you where the buildings were damaged in Haiti. 164, I think 1,400 messages came out are SMS telling you our damaged building in Haiti and went to Prince. However, it took 200, I think 600 experts, two major agencies, UNDP and UNICEF, two months, over $50 million to do the project the same way that you shaheed it in 14 days. Accuracy, obviously, of course, UNDB and UNICEF accuracy is much better, much higher. However, at the 14 days with volunteer base, we accomplish 90% of what has to be done. There is a potential. We need to dip in it. We need to engage in it as much as fully as we can. And we don't have to, we have to break the boundaries between us and technology. We need to be engaged more as a UN. And we'll pick up on those themes as we, as we continue the panel. Um, Corinne, technology in the field. You're not in the field so much these days, but you certainly have experience. Yeah. Um, I think a very interesting thing is the relationship that the new technology is giving us between citizens and governments, and what that's doing in changing the dynamic between citizens and governments. And as the UN, we're an intermediary. And actually, the fascinating thing is the technology can cut out the intermediary. And that's what makes it such an interesting thing. Because you take the Millennium Development Goals, be it water, be it education. What we're seeing at the moment, and that's what I'm in the business of looking at, is what's working and not working? Why are we not reaching those goals? And there's a couple of things. One which is, is there political will? Where there's political will, so changes can take place. And you say, what's the relationship between citizens and governments, and how do you create political will through that process? And then the other thing on the Millennium Development Goals, what we're hearing is it's at a national, local level that it's working or not working. In classic UN terms, it's a bottlenecks analysis. Where are the bottlenecks? What's working and not working? Now, I can say, well, we don't seem to be getting girls going into schools in this particular village in Madhya Pradesh in India. You know what? Ten years ago, when I was sitting in India, we would, what we would do is we would mobilize a group of youth reporters, and they would go out and report on what was going on in the schools. And they'd say, well, we bought, built toilets, but they're all locked. And, the reason that, and they're locked because the teachers lock them, and so the girls don't go to school because they don't want to actually defecate out in the open, so therefore they're not going to school. And we would print these reports in a newsletter, and then we'd take them to the district commissioner who'd say, oh, right now, and then he'd come back and then start taking the action on it. And maybe over a period of a year, we'd have a success story. You know what? You, cut out, you can cut us out. With people like Ushaidi, and we're doing this in Kenya right now, we can build a process where citizens themselves, one, can know their rights, because they've got to know their rights, and two, can report in directly what's working. The primary health centre is closed. It's locked because the worker is off, actually, somewhere else, getting their private income. But they can report in directly. They don't need me arriving in my four-wheel drive or my assessment mission. They can do it directly. Letting go and letting the UN step away from that and facilitating that can change the dynamic of how we work, and there's a great opportunity. But we've got to think through how we do it in partnership in partnership with communities, in partnership with advocacy groups at a local level, in partnership with government, so that we build that citizen-state dialogue so the poor can demand their rights and their commitments that have been made at the global level at things like the Special Session, the World Summit, the Summit on um, the MDGs, those sorts of places. So there's a real shift and the opportunity is there that this new technology can actually get this active citizenship and grow that active citizenship. Are you using it already? Mm. <laughs> we are starting to build it. Today in Kenya, I, would, I promised I would be here, and so I didn't go to Kenya to the political launch of a process with the Ushahidi folks, the Sodnet folks. We're building something called Huduma. Huduma, which is your uh, Swahili for services, and saying, here are the services in the new constitution that are your right. Let's educate citizens about those services and with government ask them to report in what's working or not working. We're starting the process and this is in partnership with government, in partnership with the UN, in partnership with advocacy groups to start doing that. This is in the fruition right now and I hope if this a year's time we would be able to come back to this group and say this is the difference it's making. The difference it's making to a primary health centre that's open. A difference to a toilet block that had X amount of Naira actually allocated, wasn't built and is now built because it, we were able to mobilise citizens to do that. It's got to be a combination of 
the constitutional situation where people have a right to information, making that information known, mobilizing citizens, and then utilizing the technology. The technology without that bit won't work. The technology without a response from government won't work either. So you have to have a mix of processes that can actually move things forward. But it's starting to happen, and it's starting to build. And the appetite is enormous for it. And interestingly, the appetite from governments is enormous. There's an interest in India, in Nigeria, in Uganda for us to move with this sort of process. Whether we, as the UN, can move quickly enough. <coughs> Certainly one of the key themes throughout the afternoon. We'll be sure we don't exhaust that theme. Um, Nigel, Nigel Snowd, uh, so, new technology in the field, changing what you do, what you see. It's, it's kind of interesting. I've recently joined you and Ocha in the UN after several years with Microsoft where we've been working with governments on humanitarian, with the US government, but also uh, with lots of other groups on humanitarian technology, social media, etc. And I was with the UN before doing crisis response in the field. So it's interesting to come back in and say, okay, well, let's, let's <coughs> grapple with this challenge again in this context. And I was actually in Haiti last year on loan to the UN during the first few days and weeks of the earthquake and watching what was going on and trying to help link up some of the new technologies, the 4636 tweets that were coming out, the messages and so forth. And there's a few things that we're, we're trying to do and, and, and adjust. I'll probably say, first of all, the existence of feedback in real time is not new. It's just the volume and the channels are what's sort of sprouted, if you like, and flowered. Because there's a story I like to tell about a woman in Darfur, I think, in 2005 or 2006, who, who sent a text message to the head of the UN in the Sudan saying, I didn't get the things I was promised from her camp in the middle of nowhere. Right? Now that rightly freaked him out because um, it's like, oh my God, how'd she get my phone number? What's going on? And so forth. Right? But that kind of transparency and demand hasn't, didn't really sort of erupt, if you like, till we saw the messages in the media around what happened in Haiti. But it's been happening elsewhere. But I think what we, we're challenged with is that structurally, the UN is not a 911 agency, right? that we don't you know, respond, if you like, to the individual uh, case of, I need help, I need, I need food, I'm trapped in a building. Search and rescue groups were doing that in Haiti and elsewhere. But the UN, as OCHA or as UNICEF or others, don't do that. We're looking at how do we provide food for 10,000 people tomorrow. Right? It's a very different kind of structural problem. So the question for us around this new media is two things, one of which is, how do we how do we use it to communicate and provide feedback about what we're doing? So in a spirit of openness and a spirit of accountability, but ultimately it's about how do we enable people to better help themselves? And I think really that's where these technologies, everybody's talking about, they're empowering for individuals to understand the situation, to figure out how to act, wh whether to go to Tahir Square or where to turn right or whatever. It is very much about citizens to citizens that is enabling. And we're also getting a glimpse of what people are saying. So can we act on that? Can we act on the individual piece? How do we make sense of that? And I can say, frankly, having come from the commercial sector, police departments and governments in the US don't know how to do this either. It's not like we're the only people challenged by making sense of this. Mm -hmm. How do we validate it? Is it really true? What do I do with it, et cetera? And so I think we see it as an opportunity. We're actually doing, a, uh, with the support of the UN Foundation, the Vodafone Foundation, two of the sponsors of this event, and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, we've just done a big, coming to a conclusion, a big study about how the humanitarian cluster system and the formal system adapts to some of these new technologies and these new players. Because we're being overwhelmed by information. We don't, you know, mm. it's all noise at the moment. How do we turn that into something we can make use of? It's still a big challenge. Yeah, it's a key issue, the noise part of this. Um, Katrin Verklas, you're in 10 countries, I think, or is it more now? We have direct engagements yeah. and actually 12. So give me a, a sense of a few of them about uh, mobile phones and, and, and social impact. So a lot of the work that we're doing is um, democracy and governance related, so it's not necessarily humanitarian relief. So I think my perspective is slightly different than a lot of the um, <coughs> other people. And I think there's a couple points that I'd like to make that picking up on some of the things that you both um, said. So <coughs> I think we need to move further from the wow factor of, OK, there's new technology. <coughs> OK, so it's not really new anymore. Tech mobile phones have been around for some time now. <laughs> OK, we, well, well, you know, we can accept the fact that they're rapidly growing, that everybody has a phone, and that information, 
is being communicated at a rate that has, is unprecedented. So the tech is there. If we can accept that as sort of the basic premise and move on to actually what do we do with this, and I think there's two critical things that you both said. One is it's no longer an information scarcity environment, and that's particularly true in, in political crisis um, and in humanitarian crisis. Right? It's the opposite. It's an information glut. So what do we do with it? How do we parse it? How do organizations, institutions react is, I think, the critical question. The point that you raise is that organizations aren't capable of actually dealing with this because, in fact, they're not, they haven't adapted to the information glut and they haven't figured out how to process this rapid information that's coming and how to parse it properly and then how to react to it. Um, that's sort of my um, third point, What's, what, what can you do with the data, right? And the Haiti, or Shahidi example is a perfect example. We look, took a really close look at that data to understand what was it that was actually being reported, and it was requests for search and rescue. And the requests for search and rescue couldn't, weren't answered other than by the army that happened to be there that sort of happened to pick up some of the messages, right? So you're creating a set of expectations for response that weren't met, basically. You know, you were concerned with water for a million people. You weren't concerned with, I am trapped under this building right now, get me out. Do you, do you want to give the stat from the Red Cross's Open Emergency Data Summit? Because they did a survey, the American Red Cross did a survey of what are people's expectations of when they post a message on social media for help, right, in the US. The expectation in the US was that they would have a response of some official kind within an hour. That is actually madness, ultimately. Right? So there's a ton of different things that we're challenged with about the media and expectations. Uh -huh. So back to you, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Jahad one had a quick you, point. You, you Shahidi, actually, when, when they did the messages, in Nigeria, you remember, when the messages start coming, oh, I need food, I'm trapped in this area, my cousin uh, disappeared in that block, la, la, la. You Shahidi figured it out, oh my god, these people asking for help, we're not going to provide help. We just given the big picture. What's the picture? What we are facing on? Sure, and what, you, but what that's they an did? They changed, their, they changed their, the, their dash, and they said that it's just for reporting mechanism only, and we're not offering help. But yeah, you know, if when you're, you're trapped, trapped under, under a building. building. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is there's a, a set of expectations that is being raised, and mm -hmm. institutions haven't figured out how to respond to them, right? So for me, personally, because I deal with situations that are way more political, right? These are societies where actually reporting anything can get you into a hell of a lot of trouble. So you're saying that, you know, my, my school, the road that was so, supposed to be built, you know, actually that money has, you know, ended up with the guy down the road, you know, he has a beautiful new house. You report this, and particularly with mobile technology, which by definition is insecure, your number is exposed, there isn't a lot of safety in this, what are the repercussions, right? How do we ensure the security? How do we ensure the safety of people who are reporting, particularly in environments that are not safe, right? So we have lots of examples, very moving. I mean, I think the most moving thing out of Egypt currently is the live streaming on Bamboozer. It's actually not Twitter. I would say it's a twit pick in a bamboozo revolution. Because <laughs> when you see the live streams, raw footage coming, is, I think, the most profoundly moving thing. So the ability to tell stories from people on the ground is, has completely shifted. And the ability to experience for the rest of the world is in, in sort of real time. Do I, you know, am I concerned about the people who are reporting because they're, they're exactly pinpointed on a map. Their location is known, their phone number is known. You know, today there's reports about, you know, American companies, you know, we know that, that telecommunications is monitored in many parts of the world, including Egypt. American companies may take a part in that. You know, what are the repercussions mm -hmm. if, you know, God forbid, things deteriorate? It, there's already been a crackdown. Human rights um, activists are being arrested. Data that they have been using on social networks, on Twitter via mobile phones is being used against them. So how do we ensure that people are safe, are kept safe? And I think there's a huge responsibility on the part, particularly of mobile companies, to be bu much better with data protection and not being in, in bed with you know, repressive regimes. So, so yes, while I am enthusiastic about all of this, I also would urge us to have a lot of caution and questions um, to critically analyze and not to jump on the 
Oh my God, it's new technology. How wonderful. Bandwagon. Just before we get to Sean, Corinne, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think, Katrina, you raised a number of very interesting and actually challenging issues. And we've had a lot of discussions around there are certain environments where this, this idea of citizen reporting on services is even something that you don't want to get into. And there's clear there are environments and that's why I talk about the Constitution if you have a Constitution that is talking about a right to information that put this puts the citizens at the center then you've got at least some environmental context which is more positive but the response time has been the biggest the what what expectation do you ra ra raise because yes of course you have a discussion will red flag green flag if there's a response within a reasonable time What's a reasonable time for a failure to build a toilet block, which has funds allocated to it? What's your reasonable time for a response rate, and what's your reasonable response? That's one of the most difficult things. And what expectations are you raising among citizens that there will be a faster response? And I think that is where we have to be extremely cautious in what we're doing. Who's responsible for the response is part of the question they're saying, because there's a, there's a levels of engagement, who the expectation lies on. Yeah. Clearly the potential is, as I said earlier, for citizens, as always been the case in disaster response, for, for instance, helping themselves. International mm. actors are just <coughs> merely support. Yeah. And so that, that community building aspect is actually the most powerful. But, but we also we're all go back to government. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've, member states, <laughs> shut up. No, no, Sean. Go, John. <laughs> go, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, uh, sh I mentioned Quid, uh, the startup that Sean is, is working with, but also he's a physicist, and there's been talk about data overload, and uh, you, among other things, uh, have ways of thinking about how to uh, deal with clouds of data and, and, and derive meaning. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I guess my work started um, in this back in 2003, um, looking at Iraq particularly and looking at how um, people were dying, where they were dying, and trying to get access to information that was at that time held by the military, but realizing because of certain accents that that wasn't going to be possible. Um, and, you know, sitting down and kind of realizing there was information being transmitted through, at that time, a lot of news sources. and. Um, if you would look at you know, how they were doing it, they'd have a bureau that was based sometimes in the green zone, sometimes outside of the green zone, and a bunch of stringers that would go out with mobile phones uh, back in 2003 and report what was happening. That would go back to the bureau. That kind of human edit, human curate, and send a report back out as what's going on. You see that kind of happening again. You know, when you look back at the Haiti crisis, you see a bunch of reports go out. It goes up to Harvard. They sit down with a group of students. They curate that and kind of report it back out and structure that information. So you sort of see that kind of arc. It's now, it's sort of something I guess that was pioneered by the news bureaus um, in a very uh, difficult situation in Iraq. But what that enabled us or you know, our group to do was to sit down, take that information and look for statistical patterns within it. And it was kind of trying to understand if there was a characteristic um, signature of conflict. It turned out there was a very strong mathematical signature of conflict and we were quite excited about that. Um, we then go to the government, the military, and, and say, look, you know, hey, there's this, there's this pattern and it defines war all around the world. And they said, great, well, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> so you've got, this, you've got this data, and you say, well, we've structured data, and we've, we've found patterns. It's even better. And um, <laughs> they said, well, so what? And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really help you fight a war, or should you even be fighting it? I'm not sure. Um, and so we really, stop that. <laughs> yeah, stop fighting, you know. Um, but what we're able to do, and I think really, really the power of this is the third step. You go from data, you go to statistics and structuring, and then you've got to go to models. And the model sits down and says, well, here's my understanding of what the world is, or here's my understanding of an insurgency. Let me test that against what we're actually observing. Now, if you've got a model that can accurately represent the different kind of statistical and mathematical patterns that you're observing, you can have reasonable belief that it might be saying something about the situation on the ground. If you have an understanding of that, then you can go and say, well, if I tweak this, or if I change that, or if I change communication, or I'm understanding how insurgents are organizing, or I can get an estimate of the number of groups that are involved, or I can start to understand if I want to spread rumors amongst them. So now you can sort of sit down and say, I can go from data to understanding a strategic decision. And that's the sort of the chain that we kind of have to kind of work up. And I, I think we're getting our heads around data at the moment. And, um, and that's sort of you know, step one. Um, step two is structuring statistics, step three is models, and step four is decisions. So, you know, we're maybe a few years away from that. I think the other big thing that kind of came back for me on this is the movement away from did this happen or not 
to it happened with probability x. And it's sort of a strange paradigm when someone dies with probability x. And of course, as a physicist, you go, well, that's just Schrodinger's cat. And I'm kind of, you know, I've got equations for that. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's absolutely right. You get a report that someone died, and we don't know whether to trust that or not. And so in some sense, somebody probably died with, you know, likelihood x. And that's a difficult thing to get a head around. The second difficult thing to get heads around is when you're looking at models, people say, well, I believe the model or I don't. And again, you're in that middle space. The model's useful or not. And that's also a difficult thing for people to start to understand when basing decisions. Because it's not like you can say, here's a model, here's what you should do. Um, it's saying, here's a model, here's what it might tell us. Yeah. Just uh, because I've actually read into your work, but maybe the audience wants to know, give us a sense of the, uh, of, of one of the, when you talk about the pattern that you're able to, to, to find when it comes to casualties. Give them a, a right, greater so taste if, of if that. If you look at, um, if you take uh, a conflict like Iraq and look at the um, way people are dying, the number of people dying in attacks, um, you can plot the frequency um, of the attacks and, you've, uh, and the number of people killed in the attacks. And you'll find it follows um, to first order a, a power law distribution. So the probability of X number of people being killed in attack is proportional to X raised to the power of negative alpha. And <laughs> It's quite a simple equation. <laughs> <laughs> the equation that explains what's going on behind that's a lot longer. You know, so <laughs> that old line about I was told there would be no but math. Basically, <laughs> but basically, it's a straight line on a log-log graph, so um, with a slope of, of negative 2.5. What that means is there's, there's an equation that is governing the way people die in conflicts. And what's more is when you look at Afghanistan, you look at Colombia, you look at Sierra Leone, it's the same equation occurring time and again. So there's something about insurgencies that we can learn from the data that says that the way people die, it's not a random chaotic thing, but there's actually a lot of structure behind it. In fact, it's the same mathematical structure. So that's the sort of the first step that you make. And you go, well, if that's happening, something must be causing it. And if I can understand what's causing it, I can learn more about the insurgency and, and the kind of the process behind it. And my physicist to the left will probably uh, <laughs> jump in now. So, so what Sean didn't know till we came down here is that I'm a former physicist and have a PhD in complex systems analysis, uh, statistical modeling and so He's forth. He's like the only guy in the room that got the <laughs> equation. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to have lots of debates about power laws many years ago when I was doing my PhD. I, I completely agree with the, the interesting things we get out of modeling and what it can tell us about understanding and potentially intervening, which is always something, for instance, the military is really fascinated by. Can I build a big enough model that lets me know what I can poke here and have something happen to change the dynamics of a system? But I think in the, the space where we're all operating in is almost beyond the models that we have a capacity to create and understand and know are accurate, right? But it's definitely a complex... They're too slow. They're too slow, but it's definitely a complex <laughs> system. So I think about it and say, well, what do we, because there's no command and control in a humanitarian operation environment. It's not a military environment. The UN doesn't tell NGOs what to do. People decide what they need to do, and similarly for citizens and so forth. So we're really talking about how do we get a coherent outcome out of this that's a good one, right? What are our influences that we can have? And the uses of social media is a fantastic new tool for that. It self-organizes, but can we, can we feed it? Can we learn from it to, to make a difference, right? And I think one of the things that I'm really keen on for understanding how we work and how we feed that is that we really have only got sort of four tools for moving this beast around, right? Is can we make sure that we've got enough shared goals? That's the beginning. If we don't have shared goals, it doesn't matter what the rest is going on. It's, we're not going to get coherence in this, these players. And understanding the differences in goals is really important. You know, do we have enough shared standards? Do we have ways of sharing information? And then for me, the point where this, the real time comes in is, how do we make sure we've got enough shared situational awareness? We're dipping into the same streams of information, our sense making is the same, right? And we all s determine what we accept and believe based on lots of different things, not just because we read it, right? We put it in context. But if we've got enough of that, we've got to hope that this whole thing will somehow, all the individual actors will self-organize into doing good things, if you like. But if we don't, then we've got a, a lot of problems about how, to, how do we leverage, how do we move each of those levers in different ways. And that's the role for institutions, ultimately. Right? Great. Just What's happening, we're completely cut off, by the way, from all communication to the outside world. So, and it's driving me absolutely insane right now. Let me just say, for a record of fact, so anything? Which president of uh, which country? Obama <laughs> has tweeted mission accomplished and is heading to Paris Square at the moment. 
Who is? Good. Um, good. Well, yeah. What, what, is, what does Justin Bieber think? And any ar noises from the army? Any noises from the army? Uh, plus one B. All I'm saying is that the army is telling people to swear they've been there for the time and they're not there to swear. See, when I said I went to crowdsource this info, I thought it was just like a joke at the beginning. You got, <laughs> you got 41 minutes before cracking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, but I feel exactly the same way. You were going to say? I was going to say, um, I think there are a couple of things, and the core of it is, with all this information arising, there's two things. What is it telling us, and who is, who, who is going to take what action? And that's at the core of that, the opportunity of real-time data and real-time information. Now, in a development context, I think we're pretty clear in terms of if you've got a member state that's made a commitment that it's going to give 556 million to maternal health and it's going to increase primary health centers it's pretty much clear it's going to do it and then you have that you have somebody a name someone a district commissioner who's going to take that responsibility and there's action going to be taken my greatest fear with this stuff and we were talking about this earlier with something i'd seen that um another bit of the un had done where you get this information and the district commissioner says yeah, I know that. I already know that primary health centres are closed. I already know the reason they're closed is because health workers are off doing private practice. I don't need all this real-time information to tell me. I already know it. In the same way... You don't need to tweet way, me to tell me that. You don't need to tweet <laughs> me to tell me that. In the same way that I know, I also know that... Do you know what? When you have conflicts, you get low immunisation rates. I don't need a geo map to tell me all of this stuff. I already know it. As one of my colleagues who said when he saw all this stuff, he said, I sat in government. I knew all this stuff. You know, I, I knew it. It was whether I had the ability to take action. And I think the interesting thing is not so much the data, the analysis and the who, and the, but is it possible to then leverage that in terms of the advocacy for the action? How do you do that? How does the media play in? How do civil society groups and how do parliaments play in into that sort of process? And that's where it starts to get interest in terms of creating that net around the use of the data and taking it forward. So I think that's a very interesting... You don't agree with I, I me. I don't agree with you. Yeah. So, so I think there's actually a little more of a complex relationships there, so, relationship there. So there is some interesting data so take the drc for example the spots where there is no mobile coverage which are extensive particularly in north in the country have seen very high incidences of, of sexual violence you start putting mobile towers in there and there's coverage and the rates go down mm. right so there's something else going on where the advent and the the introduction of technology and the, the ability to communicate whether it's self-help or whatever it is actually shifts a dynamic that was going on. So the fact that he already knows this because he can go out and see it is one thing. If people actually start talking about this in a more public fashion, is the incentive change to actually do something? Is there some, mm. is there a shift in which that happens that where the, the, the sort of interaction between the ability to communicate via technology, the ability to do it publicly, the shaming, whatever it is, the incentivizing, something. I think we're agreeing. I'm saying it's okay. the advocacy bit, because the danger is, is it's a passive piece that people say, well, I know this already. It's where the transparency and advocacy comes in. I'll put in. another piece on this, which is I think it's not just about telling stories. Effectively, this is what the advocacy pieces are around. It's about the tweeting, the, the messaging and so forth. It's also about the other services that are real time, that used to be much slower. For instance, mobile banking. Right? So that's something where you used to have to go to a bank. So I'll take the case in Afghanistan where I was working there the past couple of years before, right? There's a, there's a transparency issue that's very important around accountability. The million dollars went for a school that got built for $10,000 for $10, that really should cost $50,000 to build. And the locals know it. So it's about that chain. That's yeah, really yeah. important. But there's also the police officers who, when they haven't been paid in months, and when they do get paid, they're their boss takes a cut of their pay and all the way up the chain and it takes weeks or even two months for them to get that check back to their wife who happens to be living in a village somewhere else because they're not stationed usually with their local communities they moved around the country so the advent of mobile banking in Afghanistan completely changes that dynamic that they get paid directly not through these intermediaries they can transfer the money back to their families directly 
right? With that kind of infrastructure, it and it's they had a suddenly thirty percent pay increase because the middle has exactly <laughs> so <laughs> it's all kinds of different dynamics are possible, and so the the M-Pesa system that was in Kenya that then got introduced in Afghanistan, I don't actually know what difference it's made evidence-wise across the country. But that's part of the intent for linking that to payment systems. There's a ton of different examples like that. The, the speed and the change that's just the makes... The, the, the grand edifice of the UN yeah. is peeling off. And, and we're seeing behind the curtain. And I, and I think that's quite amazing. And I think we see the same thing potentially in disaster response because one of the comments around Katrina, you know, the Red Cross gave out uh, credit cards to everybody, but the credit card terminals weren't working. So what good was that? So we're seeing in Haiti right now the ability to do mobile payments. And that's been, on the, that's been on record for a while as a great idea for doing disbursements and cash and getting people moving again, economies moving mm -hmm. again. But we're finally seeing it starting to happen. And that's going to change things too. Well, well, the good news is that as a UN, as slow as we move, and I'm sure I'm going to get my job today of you. Um, <laughs> you and I can go <laughs> off together then. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, we move very slowly with the UN. Hopefully, with the new initiative going on from Robert team and other teams around the globe, that the fact that we are learning and we're learning fast. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to report that we are learning fast. I want to try to catch up. We have 10 years to catch up, at least. However, if you look at the example of uh, mobile technology, how we use mobile technology, actually, we did it for refugees in Iraq and Syria. We were, where WFP decided, you know, the ratio and daily, the monthly ratio we give to the people who displace in Syria, we can give them on the mobile. They can check their balance. They can pay by mobile to the vendors, and we can keep a track where these people are. They might get the money in Damascus, but they might live in Aleppo in the north. So we might. So we're learning. We adapt in system as slowly as you know as we can, and as <laughs> as accurate as we can, because everything political goes to so many ranking and so many committees that sometimes they don't finish even until two o'clock in the morning. I don't know what they're doing there. Uh, it's just slow, but we are moving slowly but surely. And it's engaging and encouraging that people in UNICEF to look at the Twitter and were standing for 20 minutes to not figure out <coughs> what this is all about and what they can make sense of all these feeds coming from Twitter. It's an information, grab it. However, the decision maker, they have no time to go through this. So that's when we are, as technology people, a humanitarian worker come in the middle as it became the, the middleman who can translate things. Okay, this is what I mean. It's mean people hungry, you need to get food there. Oh, this means that people are angry, there's poverty, we have to do something about it, as a UN family. And it goes on and on. So explain things and put things in context. This, I think, is critical. And this is our goal. And to increase the chances of that, the UN and groups like it would need to embrace keeping this systems open and not proprietary, we have, we have open to, source. I came from Middle East and uh, arranged marriage. I was talking to Chris and he said, arranged marriage, yeah, don't mention it. I said, arranged marriage is a crazy thing in the Middle East. My mom and dad get married in arranged marriage, but I think we should make arranged marriage between technology, between private sector, <laughs> between UN, and between all volunteers on the ground. We need to have that arranged marriage that we cannot survive without each other because we can help each other. If you look at the UN as a family, it's a massive, massive humanitarian experience. 50 years of it, more than 60 years of humanitarian works in the ground, life for the last 60 years. And you have the technology, Microsoft, Google, all Spider, UN agency, all these people with the massive technology in their hand. And you have the massive volunteers, the equities, the base of the nations, and the ground. If you can get these two people to talk to each other in a common language, on a common platform, I think we, we, we could do a lot. And we saw that happen in Haiti. We have a very good example in Haiti. We have a very successful story in Haiti. Uh, also, part of my question, though, is about a cultural difference that could come up in that arranged marriage, which is Absolutely. private sector sometimes wants closely guarded technology. And I presume a uh, large organization like the uh, UN with its charter wants to keep these systems open. We, we all know that the Facebook cannot operate in Egypt unless they have an agreement with the government of Egypt that you can release any numbers, any phone, any, any address, IP address for anything you need for security purpose. So that's Facebook is operating in Egypt. Otherwise, no way Facebook can go in Egypt. The same thing with Google and China. Google was not going to be operated unless they have an agreement with China about certain things. So we need to go through this agreement. We have to have the common ground. We have to go through the iron these details. But we have no time for now. Let's get the arranged marriage and after they figure out the iron. I think this is a bad idea. <laughs> I 
think it's crazy, but as you know, I didn't get my arranged marriage. I fell in love, so that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think we do very much struggle with the concept of what open data means, for instance, and services, because it is a different way of exposing yourself to the world, to new actors. And it's part of that piece I was talking about before. It's about relinquishing the sense of command and control and about embracing the fact that you act by influence and that information is one of your key influences and playing with that. How we do that, there's lots of different ways. Uh, how we sort of effectively, how do we do it with intent is really the challenge that sort of a lot of us are working on right now. I think the other question around that is, um, is, is corporate accountability. Right? I mean, particularly in Egypt, I think there's been some interesting um, other, there's many, many lessons out of that one, but um, the um, shutdown of the internet, if you recall, and the telecommunications companies um, over a number of days, and then secondly, the transmittal of propaganda SMS messages via all of the mobile operators from, from the Ministry of Information, mm -hmm. um, actually first the military, then the second one was, um, that Vodafone actually made public even though they transmitted it to their credit, they actually said, you know, essentially, in order to get a license in, uh, in Egypt, we have to abide by these, you know, in this case, emergency law stipulations. That means we have to make our networks essentially available to who knows what kinds of things, not just transmittal of <coughs> SMS, but also probably pretty sophisticated surveillance. So, you know, is, is there a responsibility of companies and their shareholders to actually not abide by certain things, even though a member, UN member state, for example, s you know, says so. So I think there are state actors here that are less than sanguine, shall we say. And so what then is the responsibility in order to protect really end users and beneficiaries on the ground from you know, what is in this information glut society a lot of data about all sorts of things about your personal network, about your whereabouts, about you know preferences, you know where you are online, on the web, on your phone. You know that, that <coughs> can be very, very problematic. Just just to follow on this, during the when when Egypt was shut down out of the world, like the the only thing is line line working, a group of scientists in Google in California they created a message system was being implemented in the landline where people from Egypt can pick the phone and record a message and that message will be automatically going in the web. I mean, Google felt like the responsibility. They felt they have to be engaged in this. And we have to appreciate that. We have to embrace that. Not, uh, not that Google they need money. I mean, <laughs> they make enough. We don't have to worry about that. But however, their engagement was critical. And we need to support these kind of engagements as a UN family. So and, then uh, do we then come down on Vodafone when they uh, act in the opposite? I mean, you know, I'm all for, you know, I mean, advocating for the good here in the corporate, you know, the, the, the good corporate actors. Do we crack down hard on the not so good corporate practices? I, I mean, they all signed the agreement with the Egyptian government. I mean, they have, you work with it. I mean, one of the leader of the uh, revolution in Egypt now is, a, is a executive uh, Google executive. I mean, I mean, his family in Dubai, and he's in the, in, in the picture. I mean, now he still have his job. We don't know anything about the guy, but he's going to die for Egypt. That's what he said. And he wrote his will. So, I mean, if you look at this, you need to encourage these things. As a UN family, we're not going to be shy from engaging on these things. We must be more active in this. But isn't Absolutely. there something, I mean, Katrine, your question, do we crack down? Who's the we you're talking about? The international community? I, I, I'm, no, I'm genuinely asking you the question. Mm. Who, who are you thinking is the well, we? Well, public opinion, come, well, you know, knowing that Vodafone did. Brand damage is pretty powerful. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, you know, the global consumers union of telecommunications <laughs> customers. <laughs> Would I like that? Yeah, I do. You know, there isn't that kind of advocacy effort that actually says, you know what? We need the GNI, the Global ne um, Network Index, which is a self-governing corporate accountability <laughs> In the age of, you know, in the information society that Google is part of, that Vodafone is not. In fact, no telecommunication company is part of the GNI that, you know, says we abide by a certain set of principles ar around the, the, um, you know, freedom of expression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, is it cust is it customers? Is the bottom line? Is it the GSMA, the Trade Association of the, yeah. you know, it's a great question. Mm. Well, let, let me jump in now just it's to steer us back. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is very cool. Let me uh, also, though, before we take questions, uh, steer us back to um, this idea of how we best 
use new technology to harness the power of information that might come up from the ground up as opposed to being asserted from above. I could go through the panel again. If you could have a wish list for short term or medium term to make your life better in a way that you can utilize the new technology to get the work done, what do you, you know, where should we focus research or energy? I'll start with Nigel. Like what do you need to see? Some way of sifting through the data, for instance? Yeah, so I think there's some great initiatives out there that are just starting to be show their potential for how, how we combine all these different streams and try and make sense of it. And back to some of the work that Sean's doing, right? It's uh, the Swift River from Mushahidi. There was a RIF program from uh, Instead. There's a bunch of different initiatives to try and apply people, machine learning, groups to basically try and come to a common picture. And everybody will have different views, but that is kind of essential because that issue about information overload, you know, I, I often talk about during the tsunami I had 60 missed calls in a half hour period on my cell phone, right? It, information overload is not new, it's actually just getting worse. Um, so that sense about how we, how we can, I don't know, basically, yeah, that kind of analysis that helps us make decisions and lead to stuff is much better. I think the accountability piece about communities is really important. Um, so I think this piece about how we integrate the citizen media and the reporting to a sense of uh, tied into what we promise to deliver uh, and how we're doing is actually really one of the big opportunities that we have. It's scary for us. There's lots of problems with it. Who has the right to say this is here, this is not, etc. Um, but that's a, that's a real challenge. And my third piece on the wish list is really about, um, I, I think, I, I wish people would understand the difference ultimately between sort of the damaged building is a good example from Haiti, um, that the standard of evidence for action is quite different uh, and accountability from, uh, for many of these institutions, if you like. So the survey that's required by government of damaged buildings is quite a different level and requirement, statutory almost, than uh, a bunch of citizens saying the houses are gone. And we haven't bridged that gap, so I want that gap to be bridged somehow. Katrin, what, 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 could we, what should we work on in the short-ish term to, to make these technologies and these approaches a little more effective from your perspective? Um, much greater baked-in security. So phones need to be way more secure, end-to-end -end encryption needs to be standard, national security concerns. It's always interesting that Blackberries are so mm. secure and it turns out regular not handset not at all. So I think under the guise of national security, there's a lot of oh. bad things happening. Um, so all around, so if there's more, you know, HTTPS, there's already efforts in that regard, you know, now HTTPS, Facebook, Google, so much more secure ways in which we communicate just default, not just activists, not just human rights defenders, not just, you know, aid workers, whatever. No, default, default, default. So that's one. I think the second one, peer-to-peer. -peer. Why do we need the telecommunication companies? We have little computers in our pocket. Like peer-to-peer -peer communication, why can't, you know, Bluetooth is substandard, let's face it. So technology that actually allows us to communicate peer-to-peer, -peer, that self-organized small groups, you know, mostly probably proximity-based, but where we circumvent, you know, we are already starting to be there. So let's take it a step further. Cut out those middlemen. Sorry, Sean? Uh, um, yeah, look, I think, I think the first thing we need to really get our heads around and just kind of accept is that the amount of information that is shared um, by us as a global society will um, continue to double at a time period, you know, probably it's going to be 18 months, it might be 12, it might be t two years, but we're going to have a sort of Moore's law for information sharing and we're going to be in a, what that means is that we have to keep imagining a world where we continue to double the amount of information that we share. And pretty soon we're going to run out of things that we can share that we can actually type. So, you know, there's this sort of saturation level if you were to type, you know, all day, every day, what, what's that going to be? We're going to be beyond that. So we're going to find other ways to share information. Um, so, so that's the world we're moving into. Um, the, the second thing I think we're going to have to get from that is there's going to be a real need to, um, to create data in a structurable, usable format so that we can actually build things with it. And so it's going to be like the, the kind of the, uh, the oil that we need to refine. Um, so we need to create structured information um, to do that. When we start looking at video, that's a very difficult problem. You can structure tweets, 140 characters, it's actually quite a nice, almost machine readable. Structuring events from video is very difficult, but we're going to be moving into that situation. The third thing, I think, is 
you know, in some ways it's a little bit reactionary. We've got, we've got you know, a, a Twitter revolution in, um, in Egypt. Um, you know, but Twitter's been around for a while. It's not impossible to have sort of seen that sort of stuff coming. We start looking now, and it may seem a little bit flippant, but there will be a four-square revolution. And, you know, what that means is the next revolution is going to have a location-based component, and it's going to have a gamification-based component. So there's going to be a sense that there's going to be badges or there's going to be some sort of actions. <laughs> uh, sort of, you sort of laugh at this, but, but, but we would have laughed um, three years ago when they said people were tweeting what I have for breakfast. That can't be used as, as a revolutionary tool. But the, the technologies we develop will be used in ways to control and move large organizations and large societal structures. So, you know, put it out there as a prediction, I think three years we'll have a four-square revolution and there'll be badges. <laughs> so ultimately the revolution will not be televised. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you'll get a gold star. <laughs> Jihad. I have a long wish list, oh, but no. however, I think the three major things for us sitting here today, the wish list first, first one is, I think, engagement between us as an actors. We need to communicate more with each other. We, we need to communicate with each agency in the UN. We don't even talk to each other. We sit in the, we take the elevator at the same level, and I'll be working on a greater project, and the same guy sitting next to me in the elevator working on the same concept of the project, but in different avenue and different agencies. So we need to communicate, and then we need to clean our house first. The UN house has to be in button order. You all have to That's, both sign up for Facebook, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> we, need to, we need to organize the house, because the house has to be organized. It has to be accepted. <laughs> Uh, taking technology in, in a nice, norm way, without thinking about security. We need to be you, use Skype. We need to use Skype. Each one of us have it on his computer. It's not a security hazard for the UN. We need to, to be engaged with small technology. The second thing is we need to communicate with the private sector and bring them in. It's a very important component of the whole equation because, to be honest with you, there's a lot of technology we don't understand. We need somebody to tell us what we can this technology deliver to us and how we can use it. And the third thing is we need to, sh to take off certain things does not work. We need to learn ex from previous experience. Lesson learned is a very important thing for us. As a, an agency, we learned from tsunami, we know that bottled water is not going to work. In tsunami, everybody sent water. The first batch of aid went to tsunami was water. Nobody sent a blanket. I mean, people freezing. What do you want to send water for? They're going to flood with water. <laughs> oh, clean water, cholera. It never happened there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, it was <laughs> warehouses of water. They didn't know what to do with it. Eventually, because we have 1,000 agencies was working on the ground in the first three days, we have overload with the stock we don't need. We need to communicate. So the more we communicate with each other, the more we, we explain to each other what we are using, what worked for us, what didn't work, well, I think we can be better. And uh, this is, you know, this is the norm. You, know, you need to eliminate what doesn't work for you. You're describing an organizational issue. The technology is there to solve that water problem, right? I mean, that no, doesn't absolutely. require absolutely. nuclear physics. Absolutely, absolutely. But just we, we never talk. We were on the ground. We didn't know who was on the ground mm -hmm. at that time. The yeah. first week, we were like, really, nobody knows anything in tsunami. Sorry, send water purification yeah. tablets rather than water Bottle as well. Water. But anyway. Exactly. <laughs> That's a new technology, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, so Karim, we have some, um, some, some millennium goals to fulfill around the world. And so give me a wish list that might involve technology and crowdsourcing and well, that kind of stuff. You know, I think we're at a moment where if we had the evidence that the use of technology, particularly citizen engagement, could actually contribute, and I'd never get into attribute, but to contribute to development outcomes, reduction of maternal mortality rates, etc. If we had that evidence now, today, we would be in a position to actually argue that evidence, and if that evidence was how it could contribute at scale, to actually take to scale an engagement with citizens to help achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And we're missing that evidence. So in a way, it's not about what the technology will do. Where is the evidence that by utilizing the technology in this way, it leads to these outcomes that are actually set in terms of not proxy indicators, but actually the goals that have been set, that would give a fundamental difference to the trajectory of how much the technology is taken and how it's then used by the UN and actually member states. Because 
at the moment it's slightly in danger of being an exciting sideshow in development and not a core piece of what is the serious development discourse around what is it going to take to move things forward and that's where we've got to move it we've got to not just move it from the wow factor but moving it move it into the place where we see the evidence for the contribution thank you promise to take some of your questions who's got a question anybody here just from the yeah right there yeah. tell us your name if you would So uh, I'll repeat it if I can. I'm Eric Schaefer. I, I've been working at UNICEF for the last five years so, uh, with technology, so uh, sort of thinking about these sorts of things. And I think one of the, the, the ways the UN likes to do things is to create the model of, 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 of the situation and then create the institutions around to support that model. But one of the strange things about technology projects is that it has sort of an observational effect, right? You introduce the technology, it changes the model faster than you can use formal monitoring and evaluation practices to provide the evidence. Um, uh, that, that the UN so needs in order to like make large policy decisions. So I think that, that one, of the, one of the issues that I would like to hear uh, any of the panelists sort of try to address is as the technology itself is changing the model, how can the organizational structure of the UN then be changed to adopt to a much more fluid, adaptable situation on the ground? Not a softball. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think it, it's a dreamland. I mean, <laughs> <coughs> the UN, every year the UN gather in September to discuss the budget for the next millennium and next years. And they stay until 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. All the G staff get double paid and all the senior staff get their own salary away from them. They bring their food, they sleep in their offices, discussion just about budget. So imagine you're talking about a policy change something fundamental like this, it will take forever. What well, I think the best approach that get the result done? Come with the result to your senior manager, say, listen, this has worked. You want to take it or leave it? This has worked. We saw it in Haiti works. We saw it in Pakistan works. We need to dip to the things exist, and we don't have to be shy. One of the largest insurance companies in the world has a data about Pakistan flood 10 days before the flood took a place. Because they're an insurance company. They know to know what a disaster. They are the best people to dip in. That's the best people to ask you more than the next quick is going to be. That company actually predicted tsunami. And they said that's going to be something within that 10 years. And it happened. They were sitting in their offices. Nobody dipped on that. After the, the, you know, the flood and the madness happened, oh, we have it. I mean, nobody asked him, so what do you want to release it for? So engaging in a policy changing, it's, it's something, it's too complicated. It's easier to create new things in the UN. We're so good in that. A resolution, a general assembly, it goes like this. And hopefully we get the balls inside and it gets established and we start from there. That's a good place to start because it's fresh. And hopefully it works. I've, but I hear you. I've got an anecdote about some of those insurance companies from, okay. from a good friend of mine who's deep inside them. He was watching a presentation about global risk models for hurricanes coming through the Caribbean, the east of the US, etc., along the lines of what you're talking about. And there were two of them, they were reasonably different. He said, why are they different? He said, well, that's the one we show the investors who believe in global warming, and that's the one we show the investors who don't believe in global warming. <laughs> right? That's true. Um, seriously, true. no joke there. So, so there's, there's lots of levels in, in this stuff. Um, I, I, one of the changes that we've seen in technology, project management, lots of different ways people organise, is really moving to a more agile, fluid approach to development. I used to run an agile team many years ago. And I really love that approach because it says we can't define everything up front that's going to happen. We know we have to adapt to what's coming. It's a different management model. It's a different way of uh, getting a team organized. Drives donors crazy. Drives donors <laughs> insane. So that's, no our, that's, our, that's, our, that's our really big challenge. The funding. I was going to say, it's the funding piece. We set up, when we write projects in the UN or in any aid agency or any government actually, we promise. We have, we're making a commitment that we're going to lead to these outcomes. Yeah, log frames. <laughs> right, log frames, yeah. right? This leads to that, leads to this, leads to that. Um, with all the risks down the side and how we mitigate them, right? And so we have a great deal of difficulty stating the fact that we don't know, but we're going to build an organisation or a group of people, a team that's capable of adapting and doing what we can. And that is rightfully scary to a bunch of donors and so forth. So I think that's our, I mean, that's really, you say, how do we move to that model? 
I don't know, but I think it's one of the things that stymies our ability to innovate, because innovation is by definition unpredictable, the outcomes. So I, th I think curating a culture of innovation, I'll put it, uh, coming back to the risk thing, I think it's actually is around a sensitivity to risk. Because if you look at how a drug company invests in uh, drug development, right. they used to say, we'll follow this path and this path, and that'll get us there. And if it didn't work, they'd do a new, pop, a new have a go. What you see happening in the past 15 years or so is a full portfolio approach, whereby we have the risk of this, we have to keep enough risk in our portfolio. Right? There's some things that are sure bets, some things that are risky, and we know we need all of them to get the outcome. You know, real options gives us even mathematical models for predicting this is what the stock market people do, etc. So that portfolio model that accounts for risks and probabilities a bit is, our, is actually a much better way of predicting good outcomes than simply saying, we know this will lead to that. Do you have a quick comment? I'm going to take one more question. Well, I think, Merrick, you actually, in the very team that you sit in, is part of the answer. The fact that UNICEF has decided to invest in an innovation unit speaks to an unusual animal within the UN system, certainly. The idea it seeks to do that. Now, the interesting thing is UNICEF has the capacity to do that because it has a source of funding which is not tied to specific Donor. outcomes, donors <laughs> saying, because it has that riches, those riches. And the greatest danger, actually, in this economic environment is, is that you reduce down to what, what we believe we know is going to be the thing that is going to deliver. So we go back to those sorts of models. And you see it in the donor discourse coming through. You know, we're not going to buy this new product, as a number of donors have said to me, we're not buying this product because we want to go to the ones where we have the evidence that we know it. And so therefore you're in a cycle of the continuation of investing, investing in the same sort of things. So there is a danger that, certainly for the UN, it doesn't seek to do it because it doesn't have the freedom to do it because it doesn't having, have the funding to do it. That's not an answer, that's a problem. <laughs> we've, at, we've actually been um, demonstrating for you something called Twitter clairvoyance. Some of the questions have come in electronically. We've just magically answered in the course of the discussion. So uh, we one have last no question. To Twitter currently. <laughs> <laughs> one last question from the hall. Uh, up here, there's a question here. Tell us your name, sir. Uh, my name is Roland Nicholson. Uh, in a previous life, I had to uh, represent uh, the city in negotiations with the UN to dis in dispute over <coughs> water bills for various consulates. Uh, I was a young lawyer then. I arrived at the meeting uh, expecting to find two or three people in the room with me. And there were 17. 12 attorneys and about six paralegals from different countries around the world. We spent three and a half hours and absolutely nothing but confusion resulted from that meeting. Uh, I do a lot of work in China now, in Asia. And clients of mine, I was there, I, I was, I was in, in Sichuan during the earthquake uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the reason that people knew that they were building code violations and that so many schools were injured, were, were damaged, while some government buildings were not destroyed, was the fact that people had gone online and had told each other, and we knew before the, the People's Liberation Army showed up why, why certain buildings were destroyed and certain buildings were not. And a climate like this, Will the UN, how much does the UN devote to technology? And is the UN in danger of becoming a canoe in a world full of battleships or, or super tankers? Well, a, a brief answer because that is going to be the topic of, in part, of our next discussion, which is so, what a beautiful way that you've teed up the next panel. But any quick reactions here? I think, I think it's a new bacteria. It hit UNICEF first. It's an innovation unit, a small bunch of kids were sitting on the sixth floor. Chris? Six? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drive me nuts every day, <laughs> no, sitting with the computer. Chairs. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and eventually I found them, they've been awarded for humanitarian works in Africa. That's fantastic. And the bacteria hit. It's a good bacteria. It's hitting the UN. I love it. And I want to see it more and more. There's a good bacteria, bad bacteria. I love the good bacteria. I hope to see it in the UN. I hope to see have it you, in UN. UNICEF has some bad. innovation. <laughs> UNDB has some innovation starting. World Bank has the We are moving, as I said, slowly but surely. But we'll get there. Another 10 years. We'll I, get there. I think, <laughs> you know, one, one thing to kind of bear in mind, if you look at, you know, the number of times we talk at real time, you know, the people put their hands and say, you're Ushahidi. They're like four guys and about $2 million in funding. You, you win's quite big from last time I heard. I mean, you know, there should be more of, of that happening. And it's, it's abhorrent that it isn't. 
So, you know, if, if $2 million and four or five people um, can do things the UN can't, something's wrong. But I think that, I mean, Ushayidi, fantastic group. The group we're working with, Sodnet, fantastic group. Why would, you know, what we should be doing is supporting them to do that. Give them some money. Not trying to replace them. Not trying to replace them. You know, the point is, what we bring is an expertise in understanding, in my case, the development context. What works, what doesn't in the development context. Don't try and set ourselves up to do that. F support them. Support them to grow at a pace they can without pushing them so hard they can't actually deliver. And I think it would be extremely foolish for the UN to say, we're now going, these guys aren't innovation unit because they're programming. They're working with the sort of folks who are down there doing it, like it's the Ushaiti. And I think it's important that we say that. Let's be clear what the UN is and what the UN isn't. And the, the UN is not going to be a group of like Ushaidi, and never should we. And we should always recognize where that capacity and talent uh, is and help to support those sort of things. But not always end up just with Ushaidi, because we're in danger of always loading it on one group of four no, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a tiny organization, you know, we're four people and 20,000, you know, individuals around the world. but. You know, the fact that I'm here, the fact that the innovation team, you know, is, when we're regularly talking, the fact that I know you, the fact that I know you, that we have these kinds of conversations all the time is, I think, testament to the fact that there is clusters of people who are really doing amazing things in all sorts of circles. And so I think, you know, for me, in answer to your question, Mark, it's very much infiltration, right? It's you find the right people and you, you set the them, you know, put it exactly. Yeah, it's like it's you know, it's like a fungus or something. You that's know, exactly. you sort of like well, spread out and you get to the right people who are where it's good stuff is happening, and that's what get nurtured in, in a variety of different settings. Yeah. You know, at the Pulse Labs, you know, out at our open mobile lab in New York City. You know, there's lots of places at the Kenyan Lab. At the there's places where this can happen. And it can happen much more organically, as if, rather than saying, you know, the UN will do a project in this. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on <laughs> Stop beating up on that, man. All right, well, we're going we're to be but talking say, <laughs> real quick. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're completely right that it is about those personal networks and the social networks and so forth. And, you know, that's the reason I left the private sector to come back in is because I saw some opportunities and there are great groups of people doing interesting things. Yeah, let's talk, uh, walk our talk. Just saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Um, <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll have more on the fungus metaphor and the bacteria <laughs> metaphor as regards large institutions in about 15 minutes. But for those of you who are feeling sort of cut off from the world, there's a nice 15 minute break. I want to thank this incredible panel uh, <laughs> Corinne Woods, Jihad Abdallah, Sean Gorley, Katrine Verklaas. And Nigel Snow, thank you so much. What were you saying? I'm feeling so bad.